So uh, what I want to look at today uh, briefly is, is, is that Jesus, and really in these last two messages in the Sermon on the Mount, is giving us something to choose, two choices to make. Today he's going to ask us to choose our master. And next week he's going to say, choose your attitude in life. And that's how he's going to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount in a powerful way for us. So today, we're going to talk about choosing your master, uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 24. This is God's word, and it's powerful. And if any of you have ever, if you've been Christians for a while, you've heard this before. And it, 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 it convicted you back then, it's going to convict you today, because it convicts me as well. Here it is. Do not lay up treasures on earth. Uh, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, uh, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Catch this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And then he sums it up. No one can serve two, what? Masters. For he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or mammon. There it is. Uh, now, th let's take a look, first of all, in your outline, the positive and negative aspects of this command. Because this is pretty simple stuff, right? No one can serve. Would you agree with me this is pretty simple teaching? Simple to understand, difficult to apply and be transformed by. Yeah, and, and that's the way of a lot of Jesus' teaching. This is not brain surgery, it's heart surgery. <laughs> Easy to grasp, difficult to be transformed by. So here it is. It's very simple. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but, but here's the contrast, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, it's a simple twofold command. Verse 19 literally can be translated from the original Greek, do not treasure up treasures. Do not treasure up treasures. Now, imagine with me hundreds of people gathering around Jesus. Jesus is on the mount. Picture it in your eye. The Sermon on the Mount, uh, just outside of the Sea of Galilee, up on a hill, right out there. And picture, he's sitting down. He's the rabbi. Rabbi sat down to, to talk. And, and hundreds are gathering around him, mostly poor. But then also the Pharisees or and the, and the scribes, some other of the religious leaders are gathering to them. And Jesus says this to these people. Do not lay up treasures on earth. And a lot of these people, this is really a radical thing for him to say to these people because most of these people were really, they were really hand to mouth. I mean, a lot of these people were hoping, I got to get my meal for today and uh, I hope I can provide for my family because a lot of them were simply in that category. Didn't have much in the way of clothes and, uh, and, and didn't hardly own anything. Speaking of not hardly owning anything, what did Jesus own? He owned, let, I mean, this is a guy's group, right? He had a pair of underwear, whatever they wore back then. He had a tunic, a shirt, and he had a coat. And the sandals, thank you. And the coat, the coat was what he, was probably his blanket at night. So that's what he owned. He had a traveling lifestyle. He traveled all over Israel. He didn't have a house, didn't have a bed. Did he have a satchel, maybe a backpack, backpack like my back. He would have owned a camo backpack like that over there. Uh, he didn't own hardly anything. And it, what's absolutely amazing about Jesus, when you think of him, that, um, that he modeled, he was completely authentic in everything that he taught. He, he was, com I'm not completely authentic in everything I teach. Why? Because I'm a sinner uh, and I, I try to be authentic, but I'm not. And uh, that's why he's our master uh, and our pastors are not. Um, but, but Jesus was completely authentic. He modeled what he taught. Now, so many of these people were just simply trying to get by. Now, there were some people that were 
actually um, not, that had more to live on. They're called the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders. They, they had more that they trusted in, in those, those things. Now, if you think about material things, here's the point that comes to my mind. If you're material, you focus on material things, don't you? I mean, isn't that true? I mean, I mean, were you... Uh, you may not have been hungry when you came in here this morning. As soon as they brought all that Chick-fil-A stuff in here, I said, yeah, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm material, and material things matter. It was a little cold out there this morning. Um, some of you have long pants on today, and I never see you with long pants on, okay? Um, so so we're, material, we're material beings, and so we think about material things right? And it's easy to become materialistic, right? If you're material, you're interested in material things. I mean, that's just the way it is. But it's easy to become materialistic, which is to take good things and make them ultimate things. Uh, and, 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 and so this is, really, this is really a challenging, convicting command that Jesus is saying to some, some rich people, and there were some rich people, by the way, and um, uh, but most of them weren't. Um, this is a challenge that he's always trying to bring even those that didn't have that much to think about spiritual things. Now, real quick, when he says, do not lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven, notice that in a second he's going to tell us why. And I love that. Jesus, Jesus tells us why not to lay up treasures on earth, and, and, uh, but to lay up treasures in heaven. He tells us why. I, as I was studying this text again, I, I realized as I was reading Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on this, that, that the reality is, is that Jesus didn't have to tell us why. But he does. He gives us a reason. And I like that. I love, actually, I love that. Because Jesus is the sovereign king of the universe. Did he have to come and give you an explanation and me an explanation of why not to lay up treasures on earth but to lay them? No, he didn't. He's the sovereign. Totalitarian governments don't give reasons. They just, lo they just pass down laws. They don't care what you think. And so the reality is Jesus is in an amazing way gives us an answer. And I, he gives us a reason why he created us. And he knows that we're thinking um, rational, generally speaking, beings who need to know the answer for things. And so he's going to give us an answer for why not lay, we shouldn't lay up treasures on earth and lay it up in heaven. He's going to give it, but, but I want to make an application here which promotes what we're doing February next year. Three-week series, February. Um, it's called uh, Father Forge Kids. Three-week uh, on, on fathering and grandfathering. Invite your friends. It's going to be good. We're going to be talking about it. Here's an application. With your kids, they need rational explanations. And so most of the time in parenting our kids, we need to say to them, here's why. This is why I've given you this command. This is why we do it. Now, there's sometimes just saying, do what I tell you to do. Have you ever, how many dads have ever gotten to that point with their kids? Raise your hand. You dads that aren't raising your hand lie about other things too. All of us have gotten, we have been totalitarian with our kids. I'm tired of this negotiation. Just do it because I told you to do it. There it is. But most of the time, because our kids are rational beings... And because we love them, we need to give them the reason why we gave them a command. And if we can't give them a reason why we give them the commands that we give them, then our commands may not be rational. But I, this makes me worship God that when Jesus comes, he gives us the reasons why. Worship God for the fact that in the Bible, he tells you the why of so many things. Why? Because he loves you and he made you into a thinking being to think his thoughts after him. All right, having said that, uh, uh, why not lay up treasures on... Well, it's obvious. This is pretty logical, isn't it? If your treasures are on earth only, they will either be destroyed by natural processes or they, they will be destroyed or stolen by somebody else. I mean, it's, that's pretty logical, isn't it? If, you, if your treasure is, is on earth, then it can either decay or be stolen. 
Now, back then, a lot of people didn't have many clothes. They didn't have full wardrobes like we have today. Uh, and, and so wool was, the best, wool was the best clothing. They didn't have cotton. They didn't have that. They had wool, and that was good. Even in Israel, wool is good. But what, what's the problem with wool? Moths. Uh, and, uh, and so even in their clothes, they probably did have some linen and some other, other aspects of, uh, 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 of materials to make clothes out of. But he says, it's kind of silly, isn't it, to, to put your whole worth in how you look outwardly. The Pharisees who had money would often take gold and have it woven into their tunics and their, their robes and other things so that they look pretty good. Um, but, but when he says, we're moth and rust destroy, he's probably not talking about what happens to metallic sub substances. The word rust literally can be translated an eating, an eating, an eating, not like Thanksgiving, but, but, but um, in the rest of the New Testament, this word that's translated rust is translated an eating which probably refers to the fact that food was easily destroyed by, by, uh, by mice, by rats, by rodents, by mold, whatever. So what are the two basic staples that people had to have? They had a covering to keep warm, and they had to have food, uh, and they had to have some possessions you know, to live. And, and if your hope is in those things, they can be either stolen or destroyed. Everything is perishable or stealable. And so it's silly to put your heart in those things as treasures. All right, let's take a look. What do, what do our treasures reveal? He says, where your treasure is, verse 21, there your, where your treasures are, there will your heart be also. And then he goes to the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is dark, how great. Hmm. So what he's saying is this. What I treasure is what is on my heart. Now, we're a men's group. Isn't it nice to know that the heart is not just that emo, emotion? The heart, in biblical Hebraic thinking, the heart is what? It is your center. The heart is your center. What you think, what you feel, and how you act. And he says that whatever you treasure is where your is the center of your being. It, it's what animates your life. Your treasures are your life center. Hmm. What do you treasure? I made a short list, and I'm not going to share it with you. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's really, it really helps me. If I want to become a great man as God defines greatness, if I want to follow Jesus in discipleship, I got a choice. Who I treasure, who I follow. And Jesus puts it right out there. And... Um, well, then he goes, the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. In Jewish way of thinking, the eye is similar to the heart. If you have a good eye, your eye is going to view life in one way. If you have a bad eye, it's going to view life in a different way. It's kind of like the heart. You have a good eye, you have a good heart. You have a bad eye, you have a bad heart. You get the idea. It's basically how you evaluate things. And if you are evaluating life, uh, what your tre again, back to what your treasures are. Now, the fact is, we might treasure things that are not material things. So when Jesus says you cannot serve God and money, it, there could be some other things. Some of you might, might uh, like power more than anything else. It's not money. You just want the power. And so, so really, he's, he's bringing us down to understanding where we are. And he brings it down to one big decision that we are to make. No one can serve God. Two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. So that's, that. hmm. There's the choice. What's your master going to be? I found that things, and I still struggle with this. I'm a recovering materialist too. I'm probably not alone in this room. 
Uh, but I'm material, and I like material things, and I can become a materialist very easy. In other words, those treasures um, can become the central part of my life as well. But discipleship following Jesus means that we really have drawn a line in the sand. We say, I, I'm making a choice of who my master is going to be. And the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts is this. He's trying to bring us as men from saying, I serve my treasures, money, sex, power, whatever it is, and I serve Jesus. The change in the day is when a man, change in your life is when a man says, Jesus is my master. And, and then from then on out, it's kind of the rest of our life is working that out is where today when I have a choice to serve me or to follow my treasures, I say, whoa, Holy Spirit, I don't want to go that way. I want to go this way. Jesus, it's you. It's you every day. That's the big choice. He says, you cannot, I cannot serve two masters. When I have a master that is other than Jesus, it always inevitably overpromises and underdelivers. When I have a when I have a master all more than Jesus, other than Jesus, it always exhausts me. Uh, when I'm going in a direction that is not authentic, it destroys me. It destroys you. And that's why Jesus said this. Come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. You cannot have a better master than Jesus. And I can't either. Talk about it around your table. We'll get you out of here on time. Of course, you have it all figured out already. Yeah. The reason we have Forge every week is that we don't have it all figured out, and we're in the process, and we need brothers to help us continue to grow. Uh, well, next week, we'll talk about choosing the attitude for life. After you choose the right master, that affects your attitude. But, uh, but listen, let, let's, I want to give you real quick... Uh, and, and just remind you what Forge is. Forge is our vision is to build great men as God defines greatness. That's who we are. That's who we, that's who we want to be. Our vision is the greater Orlando area. Are we a Bible study? No, we study the Bible, but we're a network of men who want to end our lives well so that people know that we follow Jesus in all that we do. And uh, we want to be great men at home, great men at our churches, great men with our kids, long term. Uh, and uh, so, so we're in a process. We want to reach the greater Orlando area. So 2020 was COVID. 2021 was coming out of COVID, right? And, uh, and so... Uh, Did I say that you guys could talk? <laughs> Come on. Uh, so, so, you know, at the beginning of 2021, I said, Lord, how do you want us to lead? And, and, and three words came to my mind, energy, excellence, and extension. As I prayed about Forge, that we, we hoped that in 2021, God would give us the ability to bring energy by his spirit back to Forge, energy, and then excellence in what we were doing, and then extend, grow back. So we've grown back in our two sites. We haven't opened up downtown yet. It's a Zoom site. But by God's grace, uh, he helped us reach a lot of our goals and initiatives for 2021 because of what you guys have done and, 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 and what the Spirit of God was doing. So as 
we think about 2022, we're heading into our ninth year of ministry. And for some of you, it's crazy, you know? It's awesome. And uh, some of you, some of you helped start it. Some of you are founding members, and you know where we've been. What What are the words uh, that we try to articulate? Uh, sort of the big categories for our initiatives for 2022. Well, deep and wide. When I was growing up in a Baptist church, we sang a song every Sunday. Deep and do not join the worship team of your church. Uh, do not. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide, but deep and wide really serves as, uh, uh, as the big picture for our initiatives for 2022. We have a lot of initiatives, but we want to go deeper in building great men, and we want to go wider in reaching more men. So deep and wide. And, and, and specifically in some of the initiatives, uh, we want to expand our Forge communicators. You'll see some new speakers to Forge, and we're going to also develop speakers at Forge. I'm going to go through these real quick, and then afterwards, if you want to come up and ask questions, I'll be here. Full-time creative uh, director. We want to move. Uh, you saw Zach this morning. It took me six months to find him last year. We found him by God's grace, and we want to bring him full-time this year to do more things like uh, technical excellence and everything we do producing I am Forge videos. We want to capture your stories and the stories of the men in Forge and get them out there for encouragement and for uh, extension as well. Uh, we want to forge a relationship with Compass Financial Ministry so that two times a year we are providing outside of Forge an opportunity for you and your wife, if you're married, and uh, or, or alone to go through a financial seminar, get your financial house in order. This is a big deal for all of us. Everybody needs to do that. And Compass Financial is a good ministry. Howard Dayton is the founder. I've known him since we started this church years, uh, years ago. He's going to be speaking in January. Great man. Does 500 push-ups four times a week. Don't mess with him. Uh, but we want to develop a stewardship team. Uh, we want to develop an annual All Forge uh, event. And so these are some of the deeper events. And there are other aspects to what we were uh, planning to do. Uh, and, uh, but as we move ahead, we want to do wide. Why? How? Stronger outreach to men via promotions. You will be getting ahead of time promotional material for our upcoming uh, series. Every series, you'll be getting it. And you can invite guys, like I told you about the father thing. You'll have something printed, something digital that you can help reach out to other guys because it's hard to reach out to other guys and invite them to come before the sun is up to something like this. But you're spiritual and you're here and so you can get other guys as well. We're going to do a Forge podcast that will help us extend our reach. Official Forge promotion of the Daddy-Daughter Dance. Yes! Uh, that was awesome! Awesome. We're going to do it again. Creston is going to do it again with his team, but we are going to become uh, a real uh, formally associated with that, and, and we think it's just a great thing. Forging relationships with local churches and developing ease for starting Forge virtual sites, as well as promoting mentoring uh, and supporting the mentoring uh, at, at uh, Orange County Academy, which Brad Merrill is at point on. We have about 15 of our men and a couple of wives that are doing that, and so we want to go deep and we want to go wide. Uh, we want to reach more men and include them in that, what we're doing at Forge. And so there's a lot to do. Um, John Riley is going to, where are you, John? You're going to come forward now. John Riley is a founding member of Forge as well as uh, on our board. And he's going to give us uh, just a financial quick update. Oh, he's on the phone. I'm sorry. His dad, his dad is uh, um, going to the hospital today, and John's going to take him. But before he does that, and you can pray for Mr. Riley. This is John Riley, who's been a friend for I don't know how long, John. Plus. The long time. Would you welcome John Riley? Good morning. So I have the privilege of serving on the board of Forge. I've uh, been part of this group since day one when we had about four or five tables, and uh, I've known Pete for over 30 years. He baptized my daughters. He um, married one of them off. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
a, uh, to a, a couple months ago. Um, so I've known Pete for a long time, and he is a great visionary. Um, he really believes in men's ministry. He's probably the best teacher of men that I've ever known. And um, uh, he believes in building great men as God defines greatness. And uh, he's always had another saying that as goes the men, so goes the church. So he is a really um, strong teacher, a great visionary, and I'm really proud of what he's done with Forge. Um, but what Pete is not good at is getting down in the weeds. He's not a finance guy. He's not an operations guy. And so we've got some folks on the board that serve next to him that help build him up. Um, Zach's doing a great job uh, on the operations side. Brad is a big help on the finance side. But let me give you a little picture of what this last year has looked like. The blue line is the donations. And we've got two kinds of donors. One is a vision donor. Those are a few folks that write some decent-sized checks to um, kind of really pour into the ministry. And then we have our monthly donors, which truthfully are the more important set. And so you can see that kind of consistent monthly donor. It does fluctuate, though, with the, uh, when the vision donors um, uh, come in. The expenses are the yellow, and uh, you can see the expenses are still um, fairly consistent. So they're less choppy than the donations. So the green line is profitability. Uh, January, you can see that we didn't have a lot of donations. We had expenses, so we weren't profitable. But February, we jumped up, and we kind of bump along to where we are um, in October. The goal is to finish with about 240000 of revenue this year, and that would allow us to put about $24,000 of, of profit. So Jerry asked me if we were in the black. We're in the black. Um, what do we do with that profit? We put it away for a rainy day, like the Omicron variant or the soon-to-be-seen midterm variant. <laughs> <coughs> But if we can go to that slide there, thank you, Zach. So this is a look in the rearview mirror where we are currently and where we're headed. Um, 20, we had about $187,000 of income, 158 of expense. This year, it looks about 240 and 198. So, and by the way, the 240 is assuming that we're going to get about 43,000 in in November and December, which is typical. A lot of folks give. Um, well in December to get it in before the end of the year. Next year we're projecting a $290,000 income and a $238,000 expense. Um, what that allows us to do, a healthy ministry allows us to grow in the way that Pete just hit on um, and all those initiatives. They're not inexpensive, they are worthwhile, and so um, we're hopeful that we're able to um, hit those numbers. Go to the next one. This is the most important slide. This is our monthly donors. And we started in January. January's typically a slow month, you know, coming out of the blocks. We had about 54, 000, uh, 54 uh, monthly donors. That climbed up to 70, hovered around 70. In September, it jumped to about 84, I think. And it, um, maybe that was an anomaly because it came down a little bit. But the monthly donors is the most important part of this ministry. When we started this, when we had our four or five tables up front, everybody threw five bucks in the basket, and that was to basically cover coffee. Uh, a monthly donor, what we call a partner, is someone who gives 25 or more dollars a month. And so that's just kind of like throwing five bucks in the basket. So 25 bucks um, a month, maybe 50, maybe 100, but that's what really sustains our growth and sustains our trajectory. So I want to encourage anyone who's not a, um, a ministry partner to, um, to do that. It's really, really important to it. Um, I think that's all I've got to say, Pete. Hey, John, thank you very much. All right, all right. Well, 
like, like I said, we all have gifts, some uh, others. And uh, one, one, time, one time I was talking to uh, Steve Brown's mentor, and his ment- I, I was planning a church, and I said, I, I don't do well with money. And he said, you know, God could have separated money and ministry, and he decided not to. Huh. Okay. So he's linked money and ministry, and our business guys wanted us to have more numbers, so there you, ha- there you have it. Pray for Forge. Thank you for your partnership, your giving. Thank you for what you're doing to keep us on the road. And we, we want to continue to, to reach more men in building alliances with other churches in these deep and wide focus for the coming year. I've been praying about a scripture verse that would, uh, that would focus our year, and it really keeps coming back to Joshua. And so Joshua 1, 8 and 9, are the, the verses for 2022. We're going to study, by the way, in Joshua. Uh, we're going to go study Joshua. We're going to study Judges. Uh, great books. Great books. Opposite books. They're, you're going you're to love it as you meet some of the characters in there. But uh, Joshua 1, 8 and 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, do not tremble and do not be afraid, for the the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever we go, 2022, he's ahead of us. We're just trying to keep up with him. And so thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for all that you will do. And uh, I'm excited to go into a new year with you guys. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your word that you've written down that we can study. Thank you that you answer our questions, that you treat us as sons and not as slaves. Thank you that you love us more than we understand. And I pray for my brothers today that as they head out into the real world, as they face... uh, (laughs) good and evil, that you would fill them with your spirit, that they would enjoy being your sons, and that they would know that you are with them wherever they go. We commit Forge to you for another year, and our families, as we pray these things in the strong name of our risen Savior, Jesus, and all God's men said, amen. Amen. Go get them, guys. Go get them. Thank Thank you.